This video is about Tyler Bingham, prisoner number 03325-091. He's a federal commissioner of the Aryan Brotherhood Criminal Prison Gang. He's currently housed at the ADX Florence, Colorado. I guarded him at USP Marion in the 1990s, the only level 6 supermax prison in the U.S. at the time. I spent 23 years there as a guard. I'm sorry this video will sound complicated and convoluted. This is the nature of the men like Bingham. He's a study in contradictions. He is the leader of an organization that must practice deception. The ABs as they're known, or the brand, are a noticeable presence in the federal, California, and Texas prison systems. By the very nature of the organization, the subject of any one of its members connects like a spider web to many other members, associates, and hangers around. Today, Bingham is an old man in his 70s who still wields enormous power inside the fence. Most have never heard of him. I'll never forget him. Originally in the 1960s, the Aryan Brotherhood did not have a leadership structure, but instead was governed by consensus. You know, about 1980 or so, with the blessing of the California fraction of the Aryan Brotherhood, the members of the federal faction formed a three-man federal commission with authority over the activities of the federal faction. About 1993 or thereabouts, the members of the federal commission formed a council reporting to the federal commission with authority over the day-to-day -day operations of the federal faction. In approximately 1982 or thereabouts, inmates in the California faction of the Aryan Brotherhood met and formed a 12-man California Council to govern that faction's affairs. The members of the California Council then formed a three-man California Commission with authority over the California Council and all other California Aryan Brotherhood members. The number of members on the California Council has been, since been reduced to six. In both the California and federal factions of the Aryan Brotherhood, the commission in charge of that particular faction has final authority over all the matters involving that faction. Murder of or assault on a member may be carried out only if it is authorized by the commission of the faction to which the member belongs, although the murder of a non-member doesn't require any commission approval. Failure to follow the orders of the commission will result in the disobedient member being murdered. Failure to follow the rules of the gang will result in the person being murdered. Attempting to leave the gang, testify against the gang, or cooperate with law enforcement will result in the member being killed. They have a saying about talking to law enforcement, you lie or you die. An assault on a full member of the Aryan Brotherhood will result in the murder of the person who perpetrated the assault. I've never heard of the ABs issuing a verbal warning. They just kill you, or at least they try to kill you. The only time I heard of something even close to a warning was a bank robber named Von Moose who crossed the ABs in some, you know, slight way. He was beaten and given a pumpkin head, I would assume on the orders of Bingham. A pumpkin head means that your head and face swells up to the point that it looks like a pumpkin. He was beaten in the head with a portable TV. All us guards thought he'd die. He didn't. It would have killed a regular person, but inmates are like cockroaches. You just can't kill them very easy. John... Jeffrey Von Moose, prisoner number 79328-012, was released from federal custody on the 27th of February 2015. Von Moose was originally sent to prison for five years for bank robbery, and you know his wife gave back the $7,000 he stole in Fairbanks, Alaska. In his case, crime did not pay, or at least he didn't get to keep any of it. The video you've been watching was a bank robbery in Anchorage on the afternoon of the 16th of April, 2018. I'm making no accusations. 
but the guy looks a lot like Von Moose, and he's described as a white male in his 50s, so who knows? In any case, the FBI will figure it out. A few of the crimes Bingham was involved in will illustrate the wide reach the commission in general had, and Bingham in particular. Erva Ray was a member of the Aryan Brotherhood incarcerated at USP Lompoc, California. He openly maintained homosexual relationships, which is frowned upon, mishandled drugs, and disrespected AB members, all against AB rules. Edgar Hevla disliked Ray and told Thomas Miller, who testified that Ray's relationship looked bad for the ABs. Now keep in mind during this story that one of the reasons to kill Ray was that he was openly gay. This bit of information leads to one of the many side stories I must tell. In the early 1990s, there was an inmate in the control unit at Marion. I don't remember his real name as of this writing, but he was called Vanessa. He was in the control unit for conspiring to murder another inmate. Vanessa was the most gay man I have ever met. He made this trill sound constantly, like brrrr or something. Tucked his dick between his legs during strip searches, called his asshole a pussy, and complimented us officers on our looks constantly. He was more feminine than any woman I have ever met. He was also about six foot four, tall, strong as an ox. He helped murder an inmate by having sex with the man and holding the victim's hands and intertwining his legs with him. Vanessa told me, he told me, there is no more pleasant feeling than to feel a man die while having anal sex with him. Vanessa described to me how fun it is to feel those final twitches and hear the gurgle of lungs filling with blood during the sex act. This is the guy, Vanessa, that I heard Bingham talking about the sex they had. I remember it like it was yesterday when Vanessa told Bingham that every time he looks at his ass in the mirror, he thinks of Bingham. The same Vanessa caused a big stir at Marion when somebody used the Polaroid camera assigned to us to take photos of him naked in suggestive poses. Then some moron posted the photos on the unit bulletin board. I saw one of them there myself and I thought it was foolish and I took it down but somebody and put another one up. The warden saw the photo during an inspection tour and all hell broke loose. Several people got time off without pay, lost leadership positions, was demoted, and generally wrecked some bureau careers over this. Vanessa has since been paroled. So much for keeping the public safe from people who would conspire to commit cold-blooded murders for the fun of it. Now, back to the murder of Ray. The commission of Bingham, Benton, and Mills ordered Phil Myers to organize Ray's murder. Myers promised Glenn Filkins, who was not yet a member, that he would gain full AB membership if he murdered Ray. The AB members at Lompoc, including Hevla, initially planned to kill Ray with rat poison but decided against this after rat poison failed to kill another target, inmate Jeffrey Barnett. Instead, the AB decided to have Filkins kill Ray by injecting him with an overdose of heroin. When the AB delayed in killing Ray, Hevla sent a message asking what the holdup was. Filkins and Miller, Miller carried out the murder on the 9th of August, 1989. When Ray did not die immediately from the heroin, Filkins strangled him with a garret wire while Miller held him down. After the murder, Filkins told Miller that he'd been admitted to the AB and showed Miller a shamrock ring, made in the prison dental lab and commissioned by the AB as evidence of his full AB membership. This murder to gain membership in the AB is called blood in. Now to get out, you have to die, called blood out. So the ABs are a gang that is blood in and blood out. Another thing to point out is only the commission can make you a full member. Keep in mind when I talk about the commission in other videos that the members change from time to time just like any corporation changes its members of the board or the mafia changes their leadership. Another incident was a dispute over a drug debt. 
the Latin King's prison gang attacked A.B. associate Red Lawler. In retaliation, Bingham ordered prospective A.B. member Steve Scott to attack Latin King's member Ishmael Benitez Mendez at USP Leavenworth, Kansas. On January 4, 1992, Federal Bureau of Prisons Correctional Officer, I'll call him Tom, saw Benitez Mendez running away from a prisoner who was armed with a knife. The armed prisoner wore a watch cap, green fatigue shirt, and khaki pants. Officer, we'll call him Tom, called for help as both inmates ran away. Prison officers, and we'll call the pair Dick and Harry, were able to locate both the weapon used in the assault and Benitez Mendez, who had suffered knife wounds to his back and hand. While searching the surrounding cells, officers found inmate Ernest Martinez wearing a blood-stained khaki pants. A green fatigue shirt lay nearby. Officers also found two blood-stained brown paper towels in the cell of Anthony Cruz and Edmund Gonzalez. Gonzalez had a cut on his finger. That evening, the officers placed the pants, shirt, and paper towels along with other evidence in a locker for storage. On January the 4th, 1992, five Hispanic inmates, including Ernest Martinez, were placed in the hole pending investigation. They were released back into the general population the next month. Meanwhile, prison officials decided on January the 7th of 1992 to place Bingham and Steve Scott and some other prisoners in the hole. When the officers examined Scott, they discovered a fresh 666 tattoo on the left side of his chest. He had made his bones, as they say. I have heard people who have not been personally involved with the ABs that they're not feared by the other gangs. This is patently false, in my opinion. Latin Kings, to my knowledge, did not start a war with the ABs over the assault and attempted murder of their member, as evidenced by the actions of the ABs in retaliation to the DC blacks. I do not believe that the situation had it been reversed, that the ABs would have been so forgiving. So in my opinion, the ABs war with the DC Blacks never really stopped from its start in 1982. It just sort of simmered on low for about five years or so. And in December of 1996, P. Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, the DC Blacks prison gang killed a white inmate. After this murder, Edgar Wesley Hevla, prisoner number 13950-116, who's currently at the ADX in Florence, gave a message to Dewey Lee, a prisoner transferring from Lewisburg to Marion. Quote, to tell either Dave Sahakian or Michael McElhaney, specifically, and nobody else, that they'd been having racial problems at USP Lewisburg and to get ready. Unquote. Lee understood the phrase, to get ready, to mean making knives and organizing AB members for war. Lee delivered the message sometime after the 2nd of January of 97. And yes, I do remember Dewey Lee, prisoner number 01371-196. As an aside, the David Sahakian I just mentioned, he's the guy I'll do another video on. He once told me, face to face, that for every member of the Aryan Brotherhood sentenced to death by the government, they would kill ten of us guards. I believe him. He would have personally stabbed me to death to keep his word, no doubt. He once had a man killed at Marion to do a favor for somebody else. You know, kind of favor, you know, you ask the neighbor for borrow a cup of sugar, you know, that kind of favor, no big deal. Just kill a guy for me, okay? That's the way they felt. On January 2, 1997, about a dozen members of the D.C. Blacks attacked six white inmates at Marion. The A.B. members at Marion met and decided to move on and kill whatever D.C. Blacks and associates we could, unquote. Michael Wagner, I remember him too, an A.B. member was transferred by prison officials from Marion to the Supermax prison at Florence to prevent Wagner from assaulting any D.C. Blacks. When transferred, 
Wagner delivered several messages to Commissioner Mills, including a message that there was a war at Marion. Even though Wagner was in the hole, he was able to communicate with Mills by speaking through a system of drainage pipes that connected the two of them. A word of explanation here. The system of drainage pipes I talked about was sewer lines. The prisoners call it making a phone call. You scoop all the water out of your toilet and so does the other guy. You can then speak into your toilet and the other guy sticks his head into his to hear you. Just one of the cool, glamorous things inmates get to do in prison. You know, stick your head in a toilet. I can tell you this was a very tense time at Marion. Sometimes, when the prisoners start killing each other, we get in the way. I had no intention of dying in somebody else's race war. Mills responded that he would see what's going on and work this out, and told Wagner not to make any moves. By the way, I used to call Wagner Wagner. It's the real pronunciation. Idiots don't know how to pronounce their own name. Both Mills and Bingham were housed at Florence, and as a majority of the AB commission, they could approve a war with the DC blacks. If they authorized a war, Mills would signal AB members by using the phrase, it's a boy. If the war were called off, then Mills would use the phrase, it's a girl, you know, like it's a baby girl or it's a baby boy. In the summer of 97, Mills wrote, still don't know for certain whether it's a baby uh, boy or a baby girl, but we're hoping for a girl while preparing for either. In the event of war, the AB wanted to be nationwide so that they could kill as many as quick as they could. The government knows all about what the prisoners write to each other because we keep copies of all their letters when they go through the mail room. We also keep recordings of all their phone calls. It's why they try to communicate in code. Problem with that is we use the military signals intelligence resources to decode their writings if we need to. At some point Mills learned that the DC blacks at Marion had put hits on David Sahakian and Michael McElhaney. Mills sent a message to Bingham through AB member Chris Risk telling him quote the Toads put a hit on Dave and Mac. The war is on. Let Lewisburg know. Bingham received Mills message on August the 14th 1997. After Chris Risk confirmed it was from Mills Bingham wrote an invisible ink message to Lewisburg where Al Benton and other AB members were housed telling them war with DC Blacks signed TD. That's Bingham. Bingham gave Ronald Slocum the message to send it to Lewisburg to move on the Blacks. By the way, uh, um, secret messages that are invisible ink, it's urine. You pee in a cup you write on the paper with it and then when it gets to where it's going they heat it up and it it becomes visible so they're literally peeing on paper on August the 17th 1997 after being pressured pressured by Jonathan McGinley to make sure that everyone was on the same page Bingham wrote back to Mills to confirm the war was on Bingham enlisted McGintley to write a letter containing two coded messages. The first was in the body of the letter where Bingham wrote, I am a grandfather, comma, at last my boy's wife gave birth to a strapping eight pounds, seven ounce baby boy. The quantities mentioned, A, eight, and seven, refer to the California Penal Code 187, the crime of murder. The second cousin message involved the letter itself, written in a cipher system using cursive and printed characters. Deciphering the text reveals, confirm message from Chris to move on DC. Bingham also authorized attacks within his prison cell at Florence. He told AB members Eugene Bentley and Kevin Roach to kill DC Black's Hollywood Smith and Clarence Hinnett. Slocum delivered Bingham's uh, war with the DC Black message to Benton on August the 27th at Lewisburg. Benton understood the message to mean, kill them all as soon as possible. 
were at war. However, Benton wanted to clarify the cause of the war, that the DC blacks had hit two AB members at Marion, so he called Ronald Slocum. Slocum was unable to confirm. On August the 28th, 97, AB members, led by Al Benton, murdered Frank Joyner and Abdul Salam and stabbed Byron Ball. Before the murders, Benton promoted Jason Schweihart, who I remembered, and Henry Houston from probationary members of the AB to full members because they were going to sacrifice themselves by catching a case. Catching a case means convicted or at least charged with the crime of murder in this case. Benton explained that if you're going to try to kill as many people as you can, you know you're going to catch a, a murder case in Pennsylvania. Byron Ball was playing a game of Monopoly with Larry Fortune and Frank Joyner when the attacks took place. Wayne Bridgewater entered the cell where the three were playing and repeatedly stabbed Joyner with a knife. Ball stepped away from Bridgewater toward the door of the cell and pleaded with Bridgewater to stop. Ball then noticed Schweihart walking towards him, so Ball turned his body into the cell to let Schweihart pass by. As he turned back, Ball felt something hit my shoulder, and my right arm started feeling funny. Ball saw blood dripping from his arm and went back to his cell where he tried to wrap a makeshift tourniquet around his arm. Ball later found out that uh, he'd been stabbed in such a way that tying this tourniquet didn't do any good at all. Because he'd been stabbed in the back, this way, you know, right through his shoulder, it, it, they had to take a piece of his armpit off and a piece of the upside of his shoulder. AB members study physiology so that they know the best places to attack the human body. That's why they strike sometimes in places like that to do the most damage. Because Houston did not know by sight who he was supposed to kill, Benton escorted him to Abdul Salam's cell. They stabbed Salam to death at the same time as Joyner and, and the ball attacks. Back at Florence, the planned murders of Hollywood Smith and Clarice Hinnett never occurred because prison officials preemptively placed all the AB members in the hole to prevent a Lewis-style attack. While in the hole, Kevin Roach asked Bingham if he knew exactly what was behind the Lewisburg murders so that Mills would know whether to make the war official or not. Bingham responded, Hell yes! He had uh, given the order. He'd given the word for the hits at Lewisburg and to let Barry Mills know that it was on everywhere. That every AB member was to kill any DC black that he could. Bingham is a monster of a man in every sense of the word. He works out constantly. He has a fascination with pirates outlaw bikers, and Viking raiders of the ancient past. I mean, he, he kind of studies them or something. And he he's really likes those three groups. He inspired fear and loathing inside of Marion when I was there. I saw him in meetings with the Mafia Don, John Gotti, as well as the most insane, violent members of his gang, like Joseph L. Tokash, prisoner number 06373-097. In later years, after the meetings with Gotti, he helped uh, direct the ABs into a less violent and more profit-oriented organization. He also had some strange contrasts. His gang worships Hitler. Yet on his right arm, he has a Star of David tattoo. He calls people fags and ordered a man killed because, in part, he was gay. Yet he had a sexual relationship with the gayest gay man I ever met who was also a cold, calculating killer, and black. I'm often asked, what is the point of your video? It's this. Getting another life sentence is a waste of time and court resources. The prisoners do fear death, no matter all their bluster. When the ABs threaten to kill ten of us for one of them, it proves their fear. All of the murder and mayhem I just described wasn't stopped or even slowed because of so-called justice. Nobody was put to death in the four correctional officers murdered that I'm aware of. All the inmate on inmate killings, nobody was executed. Prisoners at the top of the pyramid of evil only notice violence. 
They will only modify their behavior if you start putting them to death. A life sentence should mean you die in prison and not get out after a few years like it does now. When a guard is assaulted and swift retribution ensues, the assaults stop. I know. I saw it. The way things work today is that when an inmate threatens to assault me and I tell him I'll break his arm if he tries, I'm punished for making a threat to an inmate. Nobody's concerned that an inmate is attempting to intimidate me or threaten me with assault. There's no common sense left in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The policy is set by these Ivy League psychologists and lawyers who've never walked in my shoes for even a single shift. Most wardens have never been a correctional officer but are university trained managers. Now I can tell you there's a big difference between managing a prison and a gas station convenience store. It's my opinion that the, the difference between reading a book about it and being soaked in blood like I have, there's a big difference. This is my one and only point to these videos. Some things I didn't talk about in this video that I will in the future ones is the case I'll call the broken badge incident of a correctional officer, Joe Principe of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, who served time for helping the ABs carry out a contract for the murder ordered by the Italian Mafia. Kevin Roach, who turned on the ABs in every way possible. Who the DC Blacks are. We might even talk about Barry Mills and how he cut off the head of a prisoner by the name of John Marsloff in 1979. Many other related cases and incidents related to, but beyond the scope of this video. To say there is more to come is really an understatement. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, would you hit the like button and would it kill you to subscribe? 